If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul has wrapped up his dealing with division concerning the Corinthian church. And now he's moving on to a worse problem within the church. And that's the problem with carnality. That's, that's the problem with, with things like division that we tend to accept. We tend to justify. We tend to say, there's nothing wrong with it. It's normal. That's the way it ought to be. But that type of carnality leads to immorality. Once we begin to compromise... Sin creeps in in a greater way. And, and the title of our study today is Taking Sin Seriously. And the church today needs to hear that. The church today needs to be reminded that God takes sin seriously. And I proclaim grace as much as the next guy. I praise God and thank God for His grace, but His grace does not give us a license to sin. And His freedom doesn't give us a license to sin. The Holy Spirit still resides within us, and He is holy. <clears throat> so Paul's going to deal with the act and then he's going to deal with the attitudes. And then he's going to give an appeal of what needs to be done as a result of a sin that's in the Corinthian church. Now keep in mind, this church thought they were spiritual. They prided themselves on, on their giftings and on their leaders and all the rest. Now, all of us do things that are wrong. Every one of us. And there are times when the wrong that I do shocks me. But there's a whole other thing when what I do is so wrong and it doesn't shock me. And not only does it not shock me, but I say, I did it. And what of it? I'm proud of it. You say, well, Gordon, we don't know anybody like that today. I just want to remind you this morning that tolerance is the battle cry of today's modern church. Don't forget that. Tolerance is the battle cry. It's the banner that's waved within Christendom today. And if you wave that banner, if that's your battle cry, you are about to be offended by our brother Paul, who is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You will be offended. What we're about to study is going to seem extreme to you. You're not going to like it. You might even go so far as to do what the world does and labeling many things that are written in this text as hate speech. Let's, let's get into the act. Before we get into the act, I want to do a quick little scan of the audience so that the Holy Spirit can cater my language to make sure that it's what it ought to be and appropriate in the setting of the congregation. Thank you, Lord. All right, here we go. <laughs> the act, verse one. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's Wife. Now that response that many of you gave, whoa, ooh, uh, I dare ask, 10 years ago, 
some lesser sins probably brought the same response. But this morning, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe this morning, you've been diluted. Your, your, your standards have been polluted. They've been lessened because of this constant battle cry of tolerance, 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 tolerance. After all, you can't judge me. Jesus said so. We don't have time to dive into what Jesus really said, but you can go back online and look at some of our studies as we made our way through Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me cast the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite, First, cast out the beam that is in your eye. And then you can see clearly to cast the moat out of your brother's eye. He never said, don't use judgment. But be that as it may. Here's the act. Paul says there's, there's a thing that's happening publicly. It's commonly reported. This is not something that's being done in the secret, on the sidelines, in the shadows. This is overt. It is open. It is public. And the Greek word there is pornea. Those of us who are mature enough to hear that Greek word shouldn't be hard for us to understand what English words flow from that Greek word. And the idea with that word in Paul's day is any relations outside of marriage between a husband and a wife. I think that's all the definition we need. But in this case, there's a stepmother presumably, involved. So Paul says there's a person in the church involved in pornea, and it's public. It's public, he says. And so after Paul addresses the elephant in the room, he starts dealing with some attitudes. And we've already read verse 1, and so let's start with the first attitude that's already been alluded to, and that's the attitude of the pagans. Paul says in verse 1, Such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. Paul says the pagans are put off by such behavior. I'm amazed. I'm amazed at... This, this younger generation of believers, not all, but some, who want to justify certain activities and actions. And I love to challenge these younger believers and ask them a simple question. Does the world consider that wrong? Let me give you a couple examples. Cursing. Using curse words and foul language. Many believers justify all kinds of words and all kinds of language, and they say, hey, I'm free in Christ. I can say whatever I want to say. And then I ask them, I challenge them, does, does the world think those words are inappropriate? Now, now, I get it. They use them. And I'm not saying do they or do they not use them. But if you ask someone in the world, should a Christian use this word, fill in the blank? <gasps> no. They'll say, Christians shouldn't talk like that. How is it that an unbeliever out in the world has a higher moral standard than a child of God within the body of Christ? 
And I could name several things. I just threw that one out there, right? We could, we could go down a little litany, a little laundry list of, of things that believers just tend to do and they think nothing of it. But what they don't realize is it's affecting their witness out there because those people out there know. Yes, they do it. They do it all the time. But when you do it, when they hear you do it, when they see you do it, they're like, oh. they have the response you just had to what Paul just described in verse 1. Oh. Mm. Ooh. It's like nails on a chalkboard. You liked that, didn't you? Got your attention, though. He said the pagans are put off by this. There is something happening in the church that the world looks down on. That shouldn't be, dear saints. There should be nothing happening in, in here that the world could say, look at that. And you know what? Here's the sad truth. I have heard it from unbelievers. Why would I go to church? Them folks in there do the same thing I do. But Paul's talking about this, this act that just shocks him. He, he, he had the response you had when he heard him. <gasps> what? So the first attitude is, is that of the pagans. They're put off by it. And then he deals with the attitudes of the people within the church at Corinth. They are puffed up. They're actually proud of it. And I look around the church today, and tolerance is something that is boasted. We are accepting in this church. We are tolerant here. Jesus loves everyone, and that is true. He does. Jesus loves the sinner. Yes, he does. But he does not love the sin. Nor should we love the sin. But they were puffed up. Look what he says. Verse 2. And ye are puffed up. And have not rather mourned. You're glorying in this. And you should be grieved by it. This should bother you. Paul says. But it doesn't bother you. What is wrong? And I ask myself this morning. Are there things that don't bother me? That should be bothering me. A, a good question is to ask. Are we influencing the world? Or is the world influencing us? Yeah but Gordon. They're, they're, they're going to say we're haters. And we're this and we're that. Does it really matter what they say? Now. now I, I will have to, to, to add a little something to that. Make sure you're not a hater. Because I would have to agree with the world. Oftentimes the world sees what we call hate and own sin. But it's really hate and own a sinner. And not at one time ever, not in one single moment, not even a nanosecond does God hate the sinner. So I shouldn't hate the sinner. I should love the sinner. But Paul, as we're going to see in a moment, is not talking about sinners. He's talking about a saint. Ooh. He says, you're puffed up, but you should rather have mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. I think in today's church, there's more shock with verse 2 than there is verse 1. I think today's church is more shocked at verse 2 than verse 1. Put him away? <gasps> now Paul's attitude. So, so the, pagan, the pagan is put off by it. Oh, that's just foul. That's just wrong. The people were proud. They were puffed up. Paul says, I'm present. And I don't even have to think about this one. Paul says, give me a second. Oh, my mind's made up. Don't even need a second, he says. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already. The moment I heard it, 
Paul says, I've already judged it. As though I were present concerning him that hath, done, that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Wow. That's heavy stuff. Paul says that guy ought to be thrown out the church. And since he wants to live like the devil, let him spend some time in the devil's domain. And let him suffer the consequences of such actions with the intent, Paul says, that he might be saved. I'm reminded of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18. He says, if your brother offends you, you need to tell everybody in the church about it. You need to gather as many people as you can on your side so that everybody hates that guy's guts. No, he says, if he, if he sins against you, go to him alone. Alone. Now we're talking about church discipline and we're talking about the most extreme form of it right here in the scripture. The, the, only, the only thing that's more extreme would be found in Acts with Ananias and Sapphira and God did that himself. I would rather take this route than theirs. But be that as it may, he says, if he sins against you, you go to him alone. Tell him his fault that you may win your brother. The purpose for church discipline is restoration. It is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Everything that God is doing, even right now in this message, this study, is to bring us back to himself in repentance. We've already studied in Romans, Paul says, don't you know that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Wednesday night we studied, God, turn us again, turn us again, turn us. That's what the Lord is trying to do. If he doesn't hear you, if he doesn't receive you, he says, you go get two or three more. So you can gang up on him. No, no. Once again, the goal is still restoration. I am thankful this morning that God doesn't have the same attitude towards you guys that I sometimes do. I'm glad when I give up on somebody, God hasn't. And I'm glad when I try to get God to be on my side and not on your side so that my side gets to win, God don't play them games. You get you two or three more and you go to them for the same purpose. Hey, brother, we, we, we really need to talk about this. We need to work this out. We need to bring this to conclusion. We need to try to resolve this. And if he refuses then, and only then, take it to the church. But notice, an individual doesn't do this. A pastor doesn't do this. A deacon board doesn't do this. A group of people in the congregation doesn't do this. He says, when you've gathered together, all of you together, get together. Paul's saying, and I'm present with you in spirit as, as the, as the you know, founding apostle here, based on the authority of my apostleship in this letter, and in the authority of Jesus Christ, then you handle that situation. Everybody excited? I don't know about you, but I've been praying lately. I'm like, Lord, I need your help. You know, I, I shared on Wednesday night, we're, we're, we're studying the Psalms of Asaph, which has just really been a blessing. But every single one of those Psalms deal with judgment. Every one of them. And now we're in Corinthians and Paul's been dealing with division and, and now this. And you're like, this is heavy. It's like, let's sing a happy song. But we've got to take sin seriously. And that's why we don't avoid texts like this. Because when we do, we end up with what we have today in the church. Yeah. There's stuff standing on the pulpit stage yes. that shouldn't be there. 
There's relationships happening in leadership, in the fellowship that shouldn't be happening today. And everybody just wink, wink, nod, nod, smile, smile. Everything's great. Paul says, no, no, a thousand times, no. And now he's going to appeal to them. And let's, I want us to spend a little bit of time on this appeal. He says in verse six, your glorying is not good. This is nothing you should be proud of. You shouldn't be glorying, you should be grieved, Paul says. Because God is not happy with that type of behavior. But I, I, I'm afraid today that in the church, because, because the adults in the church have lowered the standard, compromised in what they believe, lessened their morality. We've got young people in the church who are playing around with stuff they should never be playing around with. Doing stuff they should never be doing. Going on their cell phones. We'll just leave it there. But I wonder if holiness was once again the standard in the church. And not some legalistic, beat folks over the head kind of holiness. I'm not talking about that religious garbage. I'm talking about men and women that Paul's about to describe who love the Lord, who are seeking the Lord, who are worshiping the Lord. And in that atmosphere where God is able to be God, the hearts and lives of young people and adults are convicted in the presence of the Lord. Your glory is not good. And he says, no, you're not. That a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. In his appeal, he starts with a picture. He wants to use this picture as Paul has done through Romans and in our study of, of Corinthians. And I love this. I was talking to someone the other day. Jesus did the same thing. I love it when the Lord takes everyday common, ordinary things to help us understand a truth that he's trying to convey. I text a few guys in my little circle about some verses. I was reading through my quiet time where the people were astonished at Jesus' doctrine for he taught one as having authority and not as the scribes. And, and the Lord just led me to a, a chain of verses throughout the Gospels that kind of allude to, to that idea. And Jesus did speak with authority. He says, you have heard that it hath been said of old time, but I say unto you. And I was thinking that, do you know that Jesus could have used words and conveyed ideas and concepts that would have just, we would, you know, we wouldn't be able to get it. And so he uses things like birds and seeds and lilies and wind. And he uses these concepts, these, these word pictures so that you and I get it. That helps me to know it should encourage you this morning that God's not trying to, to play, you know, dangling the carrot with his truth. He's not trying to hide the truth from you. He's trying to put it right out there in front of you. He wants you to get it because he says you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. The flesh says this morning with this type of message, God's just trying to keep something from me. Yes, he is. You are 100% right. He's trying to keep you from death. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. He's trying to keep us from those things that would hurt us. And Paul says you shouldn't be glorying a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. All it takes is a little bit, a little bit of leaven. In olden days, they would take a little bit of, of, the, le of the bread that they have right now, and it would kind of be like sourdough bread by that point. And they would take unleavened bread, and they would take that, that leavened bread. It's more than just yeast, but they would take that, and they would mix it in with the, the fresh lump of, of dough. And it would make its way in the entire loaf. It would cause that bread to rise. And he's going to use this beautiful picture from the Old Testament to try to get us to understand what he's conveying, the importance of it. He says, don't you know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? He says, purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. That you may be a new lump. Look what he says. As ye are unleavened, 
He says, you are a new lump. Leaven has no place among you. Now he's taking us all the way back to Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, God has been dealing with Pharaoh and the Egyptians, plague after plague after plague after plague. And, and Moses and Aaron are just kind of getting tired. And, and the people have just been through just, you know, a, a yo-yo effect of emotions. And it's been this plague after that plague after that plague. And then Pharaoh seems to repent, but then he hardens his heart. And finally, God says, okay, tonight, here's what I want you to do. You're going to start today on the 10th day of Nisan. You're going to pick a lamb without spot, without blemish. And you're going to watch him to the 14th day of Nisan. Because you're going to offer that lamb. But he says there's going to be a seven day period within this festival. Festival, Gordon, not bull. But anyway, you're going to take these seven days and they would literally light a candle. And they would sweep the house. I mean, we're talking spring cleaning. We're talking you better hide it or mama's going to throw it in the trash. That kind of stuff. We ain't used it all year. It's gone. No. That, that, they would search high and low. They would look everywhere. And they would purge out the leaven. Because leaven in the scripture is a picture of sin and pride. It puffs up. It causes, it causes sin to rise up like in that loaf. And Paul's using this picture. He's trying to get the church to understand. You, you are unleavened. Because look what he says. He says, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Jesus died for my sins. Not for me to go back into it. He died to free us from sin, not for us to tolerate it. But I'm afraid in today's modern church, we get this idea. Well, yeah, nobody's perfect. He's still working on me. And I understand all of that. But I think sometimes we use that, that lingo, which is not biblical, by the way. And we use it to excuse away things that shouldn't be excused in our lives. For Christ, our Passover, he's died for my sins. Not so that I go back into it, but so that I can be free of it. And look what he says. Therefore, let us keep the feast. You know what that means, right? So from now on, y'all better check your calendar. And we're going to... No, that's not what he's saying. Some people take it literally and they, they kind of they think that. He's using a picture. He's saying, let us, therefore, keep the feast or celebrate the Passover lamb. Celebrate what Christ has done in setting us free. He says, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. What's interesting here is this word malice carries the idea of depravity. It really kind of speaks to the attitude of, of man's sinful nature. It speaks of his desire to do what he should not do. It's an, it's an attitude. It's this, it's this depraved part of the human nature. And then he says, not just malice, but wickedness, which is pornaria, which also speaks of depravity. But it speaks of not the desire, but the doing. One speaks of the attitude, the other speaks of the actions. And Paul is saying, you need to put that stuff away. And it starts with desire. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and desirous to make one wise. And she partook. It starts here. It starts here. Jesus says, you've heard that it had been said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh, right? It starts in here. And so Paul is dealing with both. He's saying, get rid of both. Deal with this. This is leaven. This is going to destroy the fellowship. And then he says, but with the unleavened bread, and this is the opposite of what he just said, of sincerity and truth. With sincerity and 
truth. Sincerity deals with the motive. It, it really has the idea of purity. I, I'm not just doing what I do because you guys are watching. I'm doing what I do for the Lord. I'm saying what I say because he's listening to what I'm saying. I, I'm thinking what I'm thinking because he knows my every thought. It deals once again with, with, with the attitude, with the desire. You need to get rid of that, that desire to do things that you shouldn't do because Christ the Passover has been crucified. That leaven should be taken away. There should not be leaven present, Paul says. He's using this picture. So there should be this idea of sincerity and then truth. Aletheia, that's the acting out of that which is pure. So you have the desire, the doing, the attitude, the actions. And so Paul uses these words to, to cast a contrast between the two. And he's saying, you guys are tolerating this over here. You're tolerating the lifestyle of the unsaved. You're tolerating Egypt. And he says, but Christ, the Passover, has been slain, crucified, so that leaven is removed. You are now free. You're no longer in Egypt. Stop living like it. And that's where Paul talks about in Romans. We've studied sanctification comes after salvation. But I think sometimes we emphasize salvation to the point that that's where it ends. Just say this after me. Say it, say it. Okay, say it, say it, say it, say it. Okay, you're saved. You're going to heaven. And they may even sit the pew for the rest of their lives. And all we did was take them out of the world, but the world didn't get out of them. God is looking for sincerity and truth. God knows my heart. It doesn't matter what you think of me. We talked about that last week. Some of you might think, oh, Gordon, he's just such a good man. It don't matter what you think. God knows. And that's that idea of lighting that candle. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the Holy Spirit is that candle in the spirit of man searching every nook and cranny to remove. We should be trying to get that stuff out of our lives, not being tolerant of it. And so Paul uses this picture. Now he's going to talk about a principle that he had discussed with him previously. He says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. Let me just say right now, I believe that Paul probably wrote a lot of letters. And he had a lot of correspondence back and forth with all of these churches. God didn't see fit for all those letters to be present with us today. I don't know about you, but that's about as far as I need to know about it. Now, if you want to sit around and debate that and argue about that and ask questions about that and stuff like, did Adam have a belly button and all those kind of things, you are welcome to do so. If you come up and ask me after service, well, Gordon, what happened to that letter? I'm going to say, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm not going to spend my time trying to decide where that letter went or what that letter was because I've got too many letters right here to be reading and studying for myself. So if you want to talk about a letter that ain't, Go right ahead. I want to talk about a letter that is. And Paul's about to talk about that. But he says, I wrote unto you a letter that you, you should not keep company with fornicators. Now, I think some people misunderstood Paul. Maybe even some of them mocked it. And so Paul's going to address that in verse 10. He says, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or the idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. Paul says, I wasn't talking about moving away from your neighbor. I wasn't talking about quitting your job because your coworker is one of these things. I wasn't talking about quitting your job because your boss is one of those things. You guys missed what I was saying. The principle that I was trying to convey to you. You missed it. Therefore you dismissed it. And that's why you're living. And what you're living in. And that reminds us this morning. That our belief. Leads to behavior. It's important. What we believe. So Paul's saying. 
you'd have to go out of the world to get away from all of that. And do you know that many believers have taken that idea? I was talking to somebody the other day, this might be a good place or maybe it's a bad place to say it, but I'm going to say it. In my experience in what we call the church, I've seen many, many things that trouble me. And one is this idea that, that that's, that's, that's rampant, really, in the church, where, and some of you are going to, Gordon, don't say this, don't say this, but, but, but hang in there with me and maybe it'll make sense. I, I don't want to lose you right off the bat. Some people try to make everything church. Some churches try to make everything church. Some churches want you at church every day. They want you signed up for everything. And we got something for everybody. And, and that's what you need to be doing. You need to be here. And by the way, don't forget to pay your tithes. You, know, that, you need to be here. You need to be here, be here, be here, be here, be here. All the time. Here, 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 here. And what that has produced, I believe, is believers who bounce around from here to here to there to there to here to there to here to there to here to there, finding the best schedule of things to do. Who got the biggest bouncy house? Who got the biggest smoke machine? Who got the best light show? Right? Who's got this? And, and so, because this is the goal. Let's get them here. Let's get them here. Let's keep them here. Let's keep them here. But I'm about to say something to you that's probably going to shock many of you. But I hope you get it. Because I believe it will change your life if you do. Yes. As the pastor of Solomon's Porch, I want you to love coming here. I do. I want you to want to gather with your brothers and sisters. I want you to be a part of prayer time. I want you to be excited about studying the scriptures together corporately. I want you to be excited about worshiping the Lord. But I want you also to be excited about going home when you leave here. I want you to be excited about going to work tomorrow. I want you to be excited about walking the dog around the block and having conversations with your neighbors. But we've got stuck here. And we're like, I don't want to associate with pornicators. And so we build walls and gates and communities and cultures within a culture. And we don't speak to, look at, talk to, interact with. And we are the furthest from what Jesus was than ever. Amen. Because Jesus says, you're, you're, you're not of the world, but you're in the world. You're in the world. You're not of the world. And if you remember, he was called a friend of publicans and sinners. And so, and so we, we, we walk out in the public and we come in contact with one of these kind of people in this list. And we're like, oh, <gasps> yeah, I want to hold my breath because it might be contagious. <laughs> but let me tell you what I believe that's produced. What we're studying this morning. We got our heads in the sand. And we're saying, oh, we don't want to hang out with that. And we don't want to be around them. And oh, look how bad they are. And oh, look at this group. And look at that group. Look in here. Because what we have produced is a group of people who don't know how to walk with God. They know how to gather together. Sign their life away on every schedule. Have something every night for everybody. And if you don't, we're going to go find another place so we can do that. But do we forget that we're called here to be equipped? So we, we come here so we can love our homes. The husband comes here so he can learn to be more like Christ. And love his wife. And love his kids. 
and be a servant leader and stop complaining about taking out the trash and watching the kids and walking the dog. The wife comes here. So when she's, she's in the house dealing with the kids, she's not affected by that worldly mind's mindset out there that tells her she's a nothing and a nobody. She sacrificed her life. She's not affected by that garbage. She's serving the Lord and she's loving her kids and she's doing what God called her to do. That's what I want. Because I believe this gospel works. And it's working in my life and not just here. But when we do these crazy carnal things and we mix the world with what we call church, we end up like this group of people. And we're shunning stuff out there and we're clueless about what's happening in here. And so Paul says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. Paul says, What I'm talking about is, is the guy in your church who claims to be what you are, and yet he's living like the devil. He's letting, he's telling them, I'm an angel. But he's not even hiding it. He's flaunting it. And there are churches this morning, saints, in this community where it is flaunted. There are churches where the worship leader is separated and getting a divorce from his wife and starts dating somebody else in the church even before the divorce is final. And everybody thinks it's great. And they're all gathered going, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. That's what Paul's talking about here. And he says, we should be shocked. We should be grieved. We shouldn't be glorying over these kind of things. We just act like it's nothing. He says, if, if any man be a fornicator or covetous, always desiring everything that everybody else has and not content with what God has given him, an idolater, we know what that is, a railer, person's attacking, a drunkard. Uh-oh, don't touch that, Gordon. That's a sacred cow. You're going to step on my liberty and you're going to hear it. Go on with your liberty. Or an extortioner. With such and one not to eat. What? For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Paul said, it ain't my place to judge them folks out there. People in the church sit in front of the TV, maybe even daily, and judge everything they see on that stupid thing. Look at them. Look at them. Look at her. Look at him. Paul says, that ain't my job. And some believers are so preoccupied with what's going on out there. Oh, look at them. Oh, look at oh. Did you see what she had on? Did you hear what she said? Did you... Paul says, we don't have any business doing that. But, he says, do not you judge them that are within? <gasps> I thought we weren't supposed to judge. Which is it? Do we judge or do we not judge? Yes. It's not my place to condemn you. But Jesus says, you know a tree by the tree. Uh, ugh, slow down, Gordon. You'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. So I can come to you in love and say, brother, your fruit is rotten. Something wrong. We, we, we need to tend to this. But we tolerate everything. We're afraid of confrontation. We're afraid to talk to one another. You know why we're afraid of all these things? Because we ain't living at church. That's the problem. Folks just keep stuff to themselves and they go talk about people behind their back. They never do take the steps that Jesus told. And they'll give you all kinds of reasons that they justify. Well, if I go tell him, then he's going to be mad at me. Well, he just kind of be mad at you. That's on him. That's not on you. But can I remind every one of you this morning that a real relationship is one in which you can be honest with me, but you need to turn, let me be honest back with you. 
This ain't a one-way street. You get to come and just blab. You know, I have trouble with some kind of ministry philosophies, and, and some people in this room know about my, my issues with some of that philosophy where you just gather together in a group, and you can just tell all your stuff. You can just pour your dirty laundry right out there in the middle of the floor in front of everybody, and nobody can say nothing. Y'all have fun with that. I ain't coming to that. That is worthless. We need to take the truth and confront the sin. That's how we change. That's how our lives are going to progress or progress in our relationship with the Lord. And so Paul says, of course, we're to judge within. I want you to say to me, Gordon, your attitude ain't right. And many of you have. And I'm thankful for that. Because if you wouldn't have, I don't know how long I would have went before I recognized it myself. I need that. You need that. And that's what Paul is talking about. He says, but them that are without, God judgeth. I wonder what would happen if the church would stop worrying about the world. What, what would we do with all of our time? <laughs> Prayer, meditation, Bible reading, study, having a conversation with your spouse, talking to your neighbor, actually eating a meal together, breaking bread. I don't know. I don't know what we would do. Paul says, God's going to deal with that. But he's expecting you. Right? He's expecting us. To deal with what's in here. So he says put away. Put away. From among yourselves. That wicked person. Whew. That's heavy. That's some serious stuff. I hope we never have to do that here at the porch. Now a few little housekeeping points. Before we wrap this up. Okay. Some of you may have sat in this room and said, wait a minute, I'm struggling with this or I'm struggling with that or I'm struggling with the other. Is Gordon going to call a meeting next week and throw me out of the church? No, that's, that's not what Paul's talking about because I got my struggles too, brother and sister. Paul's not talking about a brother or sister who is struggling and I'm trying to serve God and oopsie, here I go again. Why, why did I do this? Oh God, forgive me. Take this from me. That's not what Paul's talking about. That's not so our job's not to go around. Oh, look, at, uh, that's not the judgment Paul's talking about. But when it's blatant and it's open and it's in, in, in everybody's face, we can't afford to just let it be. We need to deal with it. Now, one other quick little thing. Paul says that we're going to we're going to we're going to turn him over to Satan. For the destruction of the flesh. Do you know that God does that a lot? Amen. And do you know that I'm convinced that church folks get in the way? Mm -hmm. How many times have I got in the way of what God's trying to do in somebody's life? Because I see a brother or sister in crisis mode <laughs> because of their sin. And I'm like, oh. Let me help you out, brother. Let me help you out, sister. Are we helping? I'll leave, I'll leave that to you to seek the Lord on, but you probably should seek the Lord. I'll, I'll admit, I'm the first to say, I don't want the consequences of my sins. When I ask God to forgive me, I don't just ask him to forgive me. I ask him to, you know, hey, it'd be nice. <laughs> If you keep me from the consequences. And there have been many times. I would dare say most of the time. God does just that. He spares me of the consequences. But because he knows my heart. And he knows who I am. There have also been times where God says. No. Nope, you're going to feel these bumps. And you need to. Because if you don't. You ain't going to learn your lesson. And so all I'm saying is, I'm not saying don't help your brothers and sisters. I'm saying seek the Lord first. Your first question shouldn't be, they need help. Here I come. It should be, Lord, they obviously need help. 
Are you wanting to use me in that process? Just be sensitive to that. One final thought. We're going to deliver him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That implies, listen, that implies there's safety here, church. There's safety here. There's, there's some type of covering, there's some type of safety that this man is not going to experience out there when the congregation finally says, you need to go out there and learn your lesson and make a decision whether you want to live in that or you want to live in this. you got to decide. And the idea is when he gets out there, he's going to get his belly full of it. Like God says, you want meat? Okay. Here's quail. What, oh, you mean it's coming out of your nose? Oh, that's okay. That's okay. You want it. So here's you some more. Here's you some more. And sometimes... That's the, that's the only process that works. There's safety here. There's safety here. And, and, and studying verses like this, that's safe. Yeah, I know there's not a bunch of amens and it doesn't make us leave going, yay! You know, we'll get to that as we make our way. That's the point of verse by verse going through all of the text. But, but, but this is safe. This reminds me when the enemy starts whispering in the wind and temptation starts coming. And I'm tempted to compromise and to lower my standard and my convictions and to tolerate this and to tolerate that. This, it's, this is safe. This is safe. So I hope this morning we understand the blessing it is for us to gather together. Iron sharpening iron. Praying one for another. Encouraging one another. Holding each other accountable. Because I know that I'm going to see some of you guys in about three days. Wednesday's going to roll around, and I'm going to see some of you. So I can't let my attitude get too far. Because I'm going to be right back here. I'm going to be seeing you face to face, and some of you will be like, how you doing, brother? And then I'm going to have to decide whether I'm going to lie and be a hypocrite. And I've done that, right? I've done that. But man, it's a miserable way to live. It's so much easier to know, come Wednesday, I'm going to gather together, together with my brothers and sisters. And I'm like, how are you doing? I'm doing good, brother. How are you doing? I'm doing good. And God, good. I've been in his word. I've been seeking him. He's so good. He's glorious. That's so much better. There's safety in that. It's built in. It's, it's what the body does. It's, it's how the community is supposed to operate. So I think, I think maybe this morning the Lord's trying to remind us of that. Because I'm not aware of anybody in here that we need to kick out. Praise God for that. That's a sign, right? That God's, God's working in our midst. Because left to ourselves, all of us would be kicked out. But praise God for that safety when we come together. There's just something about that. Oh, let's stand.